Welcome to the Brilliantly Resilient Podcast. What's your train wreck? Everyone has one. The question is, are you going to live there or are you just visiting? Let's check in with Mary Fran and Kristen to learn how to come through not broken, but brilliant. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. I'm Kristen Smedley, and I'm here with my buddy, Mary Fran Bontempo. And I can't stop smiling because we have, um, well, little does he know he's going to be our new best friend, <laughs> this Dr. Lee Warren. Whether he likes it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Lee, as, as he said that we can uh, call him now, it's, it's this our first doctor on the show. Now that I'm thinking no, about it. We had Dr. Fagenbaum, too. Dr. Fagenbaum, Fagenbaum too. That's right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we've got multiple doctors. We always say we are doctors of nothing, me and Mary. <laughs> <laughs> We're very good at talking with and about doctors. So the funny thing is, you know, people always say that I, I learned to harness the power of social media years ago when I launched a nonprofit and had to be frugal with my fundraising dollars, right? So I launched, I learned about social media and then I see you on Twitter and it was, I saw your post because Tiffany and Scotty Smiley, mutual friends of ours, had posted yeah. that they were on your podcast. And then I have a very good talent for stalking and nagging and finding people. <laughs> and I said, hey, you want to come on our show that we just started? And I was like, blah, 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 blah. And Dr. Lee Warren said yes. So thank you so much for joining us Absolutely. today on this show. It was, it's, it's great really to be cool. with you. Thank you, Kristen. Oh, thanks. So we usually we usually do our um, as we were talking beforehand. We usually try to set these these things up in the in the framework of a, a reset, where you kind of deal with your train wreck or your sucker punch, and then the rise and how you kind of move out of it, and and the reveal of your brilliance, where you take your skill set and you create or do or or move into areas that you may not have even expected. However, on Sundays, which is what we're doing today, our Sunday show we talk about the faith component because that was a huge tool for both Kristen and I in dealing with our challenges. And and Kristen, as you may know, is raising two blind kids. Um, My son dealt with um, heroin and alcohol addictions for many, many years. Uh, And without faith, I think neither of us would have landed on the other side, or we would have landed on the other side, but we'd just be big puddles of goo. So (laughs) I think you know, from, from what I've read about you, first of all, you're a fascinating combination of those two worlds because you're a brain surgeon. Yeah. So if there's anybody that can tell us that, no, it's not God. And there's all these neuro thingies and blah, blah, blah. It would be you. <laughs> However, you have that other part of you that enters into the equation. So I can't wait to hear what your take is on all of that. Well, that's a big that's a big can of worms, isn't it? It's a huge question, isn't it? So we're just going to sit back and let you unpack that. Just go for it. Okay, so we'll start with um, a simple topic like the intersection between science and faith. Right. There you go. Simple, simple topic. Simple. Yeah, simple. Seventeen simple. hours yeah. later, while we're still chatting. Yeah, just a five-hour show, right? Um, so, yeah. So I grew up as a Christian in a small town in Oklahoma with with really wonderful parents who. Um, I have these these memories of uh, my my parents are both really early risers, which they passed on to all of us. And I would get up in the morning and walk down the hall, and I would um, pass my mom and dad's bedroom on my right, and my mom would would every day be sitting on her bed, uh, reading her Bible with a cup of coffee at you know five in the morning. And then I would get down to the end of the hall, and my dad had a little study down there, and he would be reading his Bible with a cup of coffee at five in the morning. And and as I grew up and went through adolescence and all of that, my parents one consistent thing was that you always can find the answers to the questions that life will throw at you in the word of God. And so it was always there that scripture is the place to go when you're questioning things. Um, so as I grew up, I became fascinated by science and, and kind of got this notion that I was going to become a doctor from a really young age uh, with no medical people in my family. And, um, went to high school and went to college and got a degree in biochemistry and and went to medical school. And, and somehow it just, it never was a, a question for me of, is there a God or not? And as I got into further and further into science education, I became pretty aware that pretty obviously that most people in that world either don't talk about it or they don't believe that there's anything other than science and accident. And so it's, there's a lot of 
Christians who are physicians and scientists, but in the world of science, you just, you don't talk about it. Like it, it's this, this chasm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I saw with my eyes was that every time as I got into neurosurgery and began to learn about the nervous system and, and we, we do get to do cool things with microscopes and looking deeper and deeper into the nervous system with MRI scans and all of this. And at every level that we can look deeper, every time they invent a newer technology and we can see farther in, we see further levels of organization and design and perfection. And it just gets better and better. The deeper you get, you see, you never get to this place where it's like, Oh, now I understand how that could have happened accidentally. Cause it's X. It's not that it's every time you look deeper, more questions come up of how did this amazing system put itself together if it wasn't designed that way. Right. So I had this just persistent um, blessing of an ability to see it as a designed thing. Um, and for me, that that gave me a lot of comfort is that maybe science didn't have all the answers. Maybe maybe Christians weren't just these noobs who, you know, believed in the ridiculous things, but maybe they actually could tie together. And, and what I what I realized a long time ago, um, Mary, is that whether you are an atheist or an agnostic or a Christian or a, a Jew or whatever, you have to have faith in something and, and you do have a religion whether you say it that way or not, like you, you're putting your eternal destiny on something that you believe in and it's got to be um, right. If you're, you know, you've got to believe in something and put trust in it and that's faith. And so for me growing up and then getting all that education, I had a faith in God and I had a faith in knowledge that, that you hmm. could learn stuff and believe stuff and know things. And so my story really starts there which um, I don't know if you've read my new book or not, but um, the the new book is called I've Seen the End of You, and the subtitle is Faith, Doubt, and the Things We Think We Know. And where that came from was as I became a practicing neurosurgeon, and I was in the military, and I went to war, and I took care of Scotty Smiley, and that's how our paths all crossed here is because mm-hmm. of the Smileys. But um, after the war, uh, my wife and I moved to Alabama, and we were in private practice, And there's a brain tumor that people get called glioblastoma multiform. It's easier to say GBM. But so GBM is the most malignant cancer humans can get. And it's the most uniformly fatal cancer that humans can get. And so everybody that gets it has about 12 to 15 months to live. And almost nobody survives five years and and really nobody lives 10 years. So if you get this diagnosis, it's you're, you're going to die from it, except in extremely rare cases. So I would see this scan of a patient before I met the patient. And in my mind, I would see all these things that I knew. Mm-hmm. I know when we're going to go to surgery and I know what the conversation we're going to have. I know what the pathologist is going to say. I know when your hair is going to fall out. I know when you're going to get tired of fighting it. I know when you're going to die. Like I said, I just knew all that. I could see it. So I had this Bible full of things that I'm supposed to believe. God can heal, pray without ceasing, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. And then, so I had stuff that I believed and then I had stuff that I knew and I couldn't put them together. How do you, yeah. Yeah. How do you, I can't even imagine how do you, and I guess that's probably why in your world you have people who won't even talk about or touch the face side of it because it seems so far apart from the data, the data driven model that you, because you know, from experience. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was hard for me to sit down. So from neuroscience, we know that people that keep their hope up, people that keep their spirits up, they have better lives, no matter what they're encountering. If you can separate emotion from circumstance, your, your um, quality of life is higher, even if you die, right? You, Mm -hmm. you, You take fewer medicines, you spend less time in the hospital, you have a better outlook, your marriage survives more consistently. So, so it was important for me to recognize that I needed to doctor these people, even if I couldn't save them, I needed to help them hold on to hope and believe and have faith because that was better for them, even if they weren't going to survive their illness. And so I started studying how can I help people when I can't fix them, which is hard for a surgeon, right? So while I was in the process of writing a book about what I thought I had learned Mm -hmm. and how to help people, our son Mitch died when he was 19. Mm. And so I went from observing other people's troubles to being in this pit of despair of our own. And so um, what I learned is that I 
didn't know very much about how to minister to people when they were hurting. Yeah. Yeah. I think that unfortunately it's one of those lessons that you, you know, in life that you can think, you know, all about it, but right. until you're in the middle of it, you know, I always, <laughs> I always say I was the best mother in the world before I had kids <laughs> and then I had them and then all <laughs> hell broke loose. And that was the end of that, you know, because you come at things with these preconceived notions and it comes from, you know, it comes from watching other people. It comes from reading. It comes from filling our brains with all that knowledge that, you know, other people have amassed. But until you're in that moment, you can't, you can't know it That's right. because you haven't experienced it. And one of the things that really just struck me about what you were saying was if you can't save someone, that doesn't mean that the power of faith and God isn't working. It just means it's working in a way that maybe we don't, we feel is not the way we want it to end up, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. And I think that's a really different spin on that whole idea. We just, we just go to the end of, well, if, if there was a God, then he would save me. Well, right. maybe not, you know, maybe that's not it. Maybe there's something right. else that has to come out of it. That's right. And so I, you know, I, as I said, as a scientist, you know, I tend to study things, right. And tend to think about things and try to figure them out. And, and I noticed there, there are sort of four patterns that, that I've seen that people encounter hard things, people who encounter things display. And one of those patterns is you could call them crashers, right. They're people whose lives have been pretty easy and they think they've got things kind of squared away and then something bad happens and you know, they just wipe, it wipes them out. And, and you mm -hmm. see people that, um, even if they survive or even if their kid pulls through or whatever, they're just wrecked, right? They, what they thought they believed God wasn't there for them or whatever happened and they never get it back. And so their quality of life plunges, their faith plunges and they end up in this kind of hopeless place, even if they make it. So there's this separation of outcome from emotion, right? Then there's people that I would call climbers or they, they start, from a place of nothing. They've had a hard life. Um, one of the guys I wrote about in the book that I called Joey, that's not his real name, but he was this down and out guy, drug abuser, you know, had a hard life. His parents were, were he was a mess and he gets a brain tumor and discovers faith during the process of dying. So he, he like goes from a place that's really bad to ending up being really hopeful and had the best year of his life while he was dying from his brain cancer, and, you know, falls in love and, and, and just really is this beautiful story of what can happen if you hold on to hope. And so, and then the third group are these people that are hopefully most of us where we hit something hard and we dip for a while and something causes us to, to recover. And so even if we die from our illness, we end up in a good place. And I think that, and then the fourth group of course are people that, have a solid faith and it never wavers and th those are people i can't relate to <laughs> yeah right now yeah, no no us either we're right there but, with you on that one but i'll tell you what turns it around is that the thing that turns it around if you're able to recover is deciding to hold on to hope in the face of doubt so the thing i didn't appreciate is i, I thought there was i thought there was belief and knowledge and i didn't appreciate doubt as a as a tool because hmm. I think Christians grow up and we, we have this inherent belief that doubt is a bad thing, mm -hmm. that, that doubt is akin to not having faith. Um, but the truth is the Bible doesn't take you very long in the Bible, especially the old Testament to see that the, a lot of people had lots of doubts and talked to God about it. And God was okay with that. Um, Lamentations and Jeremiah and you know, the, most of the Psalms are people saying, God, why are you doing this? And then God shows them and Oh, thanks. You know, it's okay. So it's okay to doubt. But what happens is, and whether you believe it's spiritual warfare, you believe there's really a devil or you know, all those things that I believe, or if you just think it's, it's neurochemistry, either way you want to look at it. When you have doubt, doubt is a precipice that if you move one direction, you fall off into fear and despair. And if you move the other direction, you fall into hope and faith. And so what, what happens is doubt will tell you that you don't know. I don't know if I can make it through this. I don't know if God still loves me. I don't know if God's real. I don't know if I'll, if I'll survive this. And fear will tell you, no, you weren't, you're not going to make it, Mary. You're not going to survive this. Your kid's never going to be okay. You know, Kristen, this is not going to, God has abandoned you. That's fear. So fear says no. Faith says yes, right? So faith says, hey, I got you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm gonna, there's still hope. Don't give up. Press on. So doubt is the place where you can start asking questions and deciding whether you're going to move towards the light or move towards the darkness. Wow. 
Wow. So, so Mary Fran and I are like a subcategory of one of your categories because we, <laughs> we had doubt and we had irate screaming tantrums in our, in our doubt phase. <laughs> what are you doing? That was, that yeah, was basically our, that's how we kind of came together in this. And we found out our similar stories of the crash and then the, who do you think you are? I'm out of here. And then sure. coming back saying, who do you think you are? I'm out of here again. And then be fine. You do it. That's what we kind of both say. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're going to, yeah. but you know what I think this comes down to too. And I'm hearing this in, in everything that you're saying. And we talk about this a lot, Kristen and I, I think people have an outcome in their mind. And you know, if you, if you read the scripture, it's, you, you know, the verse, my ways are not your ways. That's right. So that to me is a place where so much of what you're saying comes back to that, that idea of faith and hope, even with the knowledge that this life that you're in is not going to last. That's a big concept for us to get around, but you, then it goes that that's when it falls into the faith category. Look, my, your ways are not my ways. That's right. Yeah. I'll, 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 uh, I'll see your, your verse there and one up you with <laughs> what I had to learn literally for 20 years is we walk by faith, not by sight, because I had the plans. I am, I am the, I was the Catholic school, like only girl in the family of a million boys that all of the expectation was I had the plan. I had everything. I checked all the boxes and then whammo twice, you know, two blind kids and, and it, I couldn't see how that could possibly be a good thing until the day that I did. I, mean, I, I saw that, that my son at three years old was the happiest kid you could ever meet in your life. And it wasn't yeah. bothering him. It was my outcome, my dreams for him. And I've said now, now it did take me all these years later, but when I say walk by faith, not by sight, I had to not, I couldn't see what they were going to be able to do. I had no idea. I just had to have faith that it was going to go well and that they were going to live their dreams. And you know what, Lee, I try to tell all parents now that that's how you should parent. That should be your number one thing. Get your dreams off of them and yeah. let them have their own. And wow. just the guide on the side that gets them the tools they need. That was the biggest thing I, I learned from blindness. And, and Mary Fran and I are always very cautious to say, we don't consider the sucker punches blessings at all. It's the it's the exploring doubt and moving from fear to faith that is the blessing right. in it. Right. right. Can, can we nerd out for a second um, about <laughs> science? So something you said a while ago is um, it took you a long time to see how that promise of Romans eight twenty eight, you know, where, where God says, I will work all things out for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That That is an impossible promise to believe when you find out, I'm sure that your child is blind or addicted or has died. Um, but what happens is, so in, in quantum physics, there's this, this reality where an electron can be in two places at the same time. And it might have, it might be because of the move at the speed of light or something, but it sounds impossible to us in this, in this big world, but down in the really small subatomic world, weird things like that can happen. An electron can be in two places at once. And I think God is a quantum God because it is, it is possible with enough time to pass for Romans eight twenty eight to be true. That it's that good has come out of me losing my son, even though it is not good that I lost my son. Yeah. And so a, a good example of yes. that is I started writing and podcasting and, and blogging and all of that about six months after I lost Mitch because I, we had four other kids and I felt like I needed to minister to them. So I started emailing my kids every day and trying to, trying to encourage them. And even in our pain, we felt like we needed to, to parent them and, and try to help them and started sharing those. And, and that, that letter that I write every week kind of goes all around the world now in 75 countries and, you know, all over the place. And twice in the six years, seven years now, since we lost Mitch, I've gotten an email that said something to the effect of, Today was the day I was going to kill myself, mm. but something you said gave me enough hope to not do that. And so that's a good thing that mm -hmm. wouldn't have happened if I hadn't started writing and I wouldn't have started writing if I hadn't lost Mitch. So there's one of those quantum things where God can, a promise can be true, even though the thing that it's said about it isn't true. It's not good, but it is good. And but that takes time to see that perspective. It does take time. And I, that's actually the word I just want to hone in on for a second, that concept of time, time and space. 
we have a very small idea of what that means. That's and right. if you if you look at what God is supposed to mean, our concept of time and space is is nothing compared to what God's concept of time and space is. So while we're experiencing right. that pain in this finite moment to us, all of these other things may be happening at the exact same moment in another part of space or time or God's space or time. Right. And it's, but it, and Chris and I also say, it's very tough to see that, as you said earlier, in that moment, you need to allow yourself the grace to experience what that feeling is because we are in the human state right now. That's right. Yeah. Exactly yeah. Right. Now, Lee, let me ask you this. Do you, do you, um, do you have moments where you dip back into, into doubt and towards fear? Or you, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's a, there's a story in Mark chapter nine, I think check that, but it's in Mark, I think chapter nine, where this guy has a son that has epilepsy and he comes to Jesus and he says, can you heal my, can you help my son? And Jesus says, anything is possible if you believe. And the guy says, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. And so in the same sentence, he's saying, I believe, but I doubt. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is okay with that. And so from that, I take great hope from that because every single day I'm still like, God, why did you let that happen to my son? Or can you even be real if my son can, if that can, if my son can be stabbed in the neck, how can that happen if you love me? And at the same time, I know I don't get to see him again unless God's real and there really is a resurrection and I get to spend eternity with my son. And so that promise, I really want that promise to be true, right? <laughs> and so when I see other promises fulfilled, like Romans eight twenty eight, and good is coming out of this and, and Psalm thirty four eighteen, where God is close to the brokenhearted. And you know that, both of you know that. Like there's times when you can't explain it, but you know God is there and he's holding on to you and he's helping you get through that moment. And so, yes, every single day, I doubt and every single day I'm mad and every single day almost still I shed tears, but also every single day I find something to hope for, to, to hold on to. And that's how we, you know, Lisa and I've talked about this a million times, like, like we lost her mom about two years ago and, and it's just every day some something hurts and some grace is given and you have a memory or you see a picture or somebody says, Hey, remember that time that mom, or remember that time that Mitch and, and it just ministers to you in that moment. And I th I believe that's God, like just saying, Hey, hang in there. There's reason to hope. Yeah. Yeah. I have to share this story because I just wrote about it. I just published an article on LinkedIn about this today that, you know, talking about that whole, you know, you see the doubt day, but then you, you have a, a good moment for 20 years, you know, trying to educate blind kids in this country is, is really hard in regular public schools. Yeah. And it was like, I had my, okay, I had my change in perception. I, I gave it over to God. I listened to that thy will be done song constantly. You know, I got this right. And then all these people keep doubting what my son can do. And then we weren't getting the tool. It was just this uphill battle constantly. Right. And then I'd have those every, almost every day. I'm like, are you kidding me? And go back into fear and doubt. But then I shared today how he, you know, all my hopes and dreams were gone. And one of them was that he would be the valedictorian. And then he ends up, his high school graduation was two years ago and he's the valedictorian, right? And someone sent me a picture because I was up in the stands, right? Someone sent me a picture and Michael's standing there with every tool that we fought for, Braille, his white cane, and the school board and the school administration is behind him that nobody expected him to achieve anything. And he wow. out achieved 600 kids and the looks on their faces were like, it's a, when I say it's a God moment picture, it is unbelievable, but it was all that time. It's that, you know, that song press on. I'm like, yep, there's yeah. my life. Press on, you know, we keep <laughs> pressing on, wow. but, that's, but that's yeah. the key. Don't, don't you think? I mean, that's the key in the middle of that, if that struggle of that doubt and faith struggle, just keep taking one more step towards the faith side. Just one little step, you know, and, and you can visit, like we say all the time, you can visit the doubt side, but don't live there. Don't That's live right. in the doubt side. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Actually, there is, a, I just listened to the beginning of one of your episodes. I love your podcast well, um, you. about the tiny bit of faith. Yeah. You did a whole thing on that where, you know, uh, Jesus is yelling at, at, at the apostles. What do you, you have so little faith. And then in the yeah. next, you know, thing, he's like, you only need a little bit of faith, you know, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that whole oxymoron thing. 
Yep. So what what is that concept? What is that concept? A tiny bit of faith, because I feel like, you know, I, I feel like we are um, if you're if you're church going people, I feel like it is hard sometimes for us to accept that we can we can be we can be mad and we can be doubtful and we can be just yuck. But right. but that one little thing can pull us back. I mean, is that it? That one little bit of faith? I think it's a perspective issue. Um, I, I think it's a it's a perspective issue. And the the, the quote that she's referring to, that Kristen's talking about, is I saw these two scriptures where one they're in the boat and they're crossing the lake and Jesus is asleep and this big storm comes up and they're going to sink right and the disciples are freaking out and they wake him up and he's like, "You have little faith. You got you're such little faith that he just tells the storm, quit it, knock it off, and the storm goes away." And so the Savior is bigger than the storm in that moment but their faith was so little, they didn't remember that the Savior was in the boat with them, right? Mm-hmm. So the storm was bigger than the Savior to them. And the other story is, he says, if you, if you had enough faith, like it was just a tiny little mustard seed of faith, mm-hmm. you could throw that mountain over there into the ocean, right? So he's not saying that you have to have this invincible, huge amount of faith. You just have to know that the Savior is bigger than the storm. You just have to know that the, the promiser is bigger than the problem. Right. So if you if you get it backwards, if you start thinking that the problem or the situation or the circumstance is the is bigger than God, mm-hmm. then then you don't have enough faith to get through that. Right. So and it's, I it's, think, it's, yeah, it's it, it goes back to but then it goes back to letting go of the, the thought that, you know, God's mind at the that's same right. time. That's the part that's, that's right. hard for me. As I'm sure, it, as I'm sure it was for you, with with the passing of your son and everything, like you said, how how I'm trying to do everything you want me to do down here, and and this is still what's happening. Like, come on, are you kidding me? That's right. Um, but but that, and I think that's where most people have that struggle. You know, I'm trying to right. I'm trying to be I'm trying to be a good person here, God. Why why? Um, but we have to keep going back to that. We don't have the mind of God, and that's a hard that's hard for me. <laughs> I yeah. think the, you know, that Jesus said um, two things that seem contradictory. One is he said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And in John chapter 10, he says, the thief, the, the enemy, Satan, has come to steal and kill and destroy your life. But I have come that you might have an abundant and joyful life. So in the same guy, Jesus, he's telling us life is going to be hard. Your kids are going to be blind and, and kids are going to be poor and they're going to have leprosy and pe- people are going to die. And you're going to get brain tumors and your wife's going to leave you and all the stuff's going to happen because life is hard. But in the same breath, he says, but I have come here that you can have an abundant life here. And so that means that there has to be a way to separate quality of life from the circumstance of life. And I think that's where resilience comes, that, that, that idea that no matter what you're going through, you can still be okay, right? You can still write your own destiny, even if you can't see. Ask Scotty Smiley about that, right? I mean, the dude is an Ironman triathlete, and he's mm-hmm. climbed Mount Rainier, and he, you know he's done all these amazing things. He's a venture capitalist, and just an unbelievable guy. Can't see because somebody blew him up in Iraq, right? But he didn't let that circumstance steal his hope and then therefore didn't let that circumstance dictate his future. Yeah. Yeah. And how about the title of his book, Hope Unseen? Hope Unseen. I mean, that Amazing is just, book. Yeah. that's just, um, you know, talk about brilliance. You know, when I was, um, when my divorce nightmare started three years ago, the thing that I, I didn't get that concept I, I didn't, I just hadn't experienced the concept that you just talked about that, that you can go through all this and you will have abundance even when someone's ripping your life apart until, um, by accident, I got invited to this book. <laughs> a friend of mine years ago invited me to a Bible study at this church yeah. I started going to. And I go, I don't do Bible studies. That's like <laughs> not my thing. <laughs> she was like, it's actually a book. Like, and I was like, yeah, I don't really do that. And she's like, they have free babysitting. And I go, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> I'm there. Kids are little, so I sleep. whatever it takes to yeah. get you through whatever the door. <laughs> so I, it's a um, Methodist church, and I grew up Catholic. And it's a long story how we got there. But anyway, all these years later, don't I get invited accidentally? I think I bumped into somebody in the supermarket when all of this had just started. That they were doing um, Max Lucado's. You'll get through this. Yeah. Um, and I know that that he's a friend of yours. He's like he he. <laughs> 
the poor guy has carried me through the past three years and he has no idea, right? Because I keep coming. I actually just did our whole last Sunday episode on that study um, because of the way that he frames that, that just what you just said, that you will get through this and, and it's not going to be painless. It's not going to be quick and God will use it for good and going in it with that perspective that there is going to be good and abundance at some point and and there may, there's still going to be pain at the same time was life changing for me like my hair stopped falling out literally when when I started that study for that perspective wow you know that's that's another one of those um it almost gives me a, a goosebump kind of feeling to think about that. Like the, if you think about how God orchestrates the timing of what somebody's writing and how it's going to intersect with somebody else's life. So the week after Mitch died, I got two books in the mail. Um, Philip Yancey sent me an advanced copy of his book that was coming out called the question that never goes away, which was about how do you handle hard things? Mm-hmm. And Max sent us a copy. We, my wife, um, is old friends with Max's wife. That's how I know we know them. And he used to be our pastor in San Antonio. He sent a cop, an advanced copy of you'll get through this, which is the Joseph story mm-hmm. of, of all the hard things that happened to Joseph. And, and he wrote in the thing, oh, this is going to, I think this is going to help you. I can't explain the timing of it, but I think it's going to help you read it when you're ready. Cause sometimes it's hard to read things when you're hurting. Yeah. yeah. But there's a passage in there. He talks about when you know Joseph's brothers, you know, faked his murder and sold him into slavery, and he ended up getting imprisoned and falsely accused of adultery. All these things happen to him, and then he ends up back on his feet, and God delivers him and uses him to save his brothers and the whole nation. Right? And what he says is, "What what you intended for evil, God intended for good. Like you meant for this thing to harm me, and God used it to help me." Mm-hmm. And so I think there's some. It helped you, right? His book helped you. It landed on me at just the right time. And I just feel like that's a God-ordained moment. So we were in this terrible situations, both of us yeah. didn't know each other then, but God used Max to minister to us through the story of Joseph, whose brothers were so evil to him. And I think if you're listening to this right now, if you're listening, you're obviously listening right now. COVID-19 <laughs> is happening to the whole world right now, right? And I believe that this terrible thing we're going through is going to be used for good in a lot of ways. I think we'll come out of it if we're resilient enough. I think we'll come out of it better off than we went into it because I think God's going to use it for good. Yeah. I think we've seen so many examples of that already. And at the same time, though, knowing that, yes, he's going to use it for good, but it's it's going to be a struggle to get there. It, it, there's going to be some stuff to get there. And I, I forget the next line that Max says about um, don't be naive. And don't be, and it doesn't say don't be stupid. That's one of my words. I forget the next part of that, but, but he's like, you know, don't be an idiot. Like don't go off the deep end and, and think you're just going to sit there and it's going to be fine. And then all of a sudden good stuff. But yeah, what a difference going into stuff knowing. And I, honestly, I think that that is a lot of the reason that my blind sons and a lot of their um, friends that they know that are blind or have been through a lot of stuff early on just are more resilient in the way that they know that there's challenge that my kids have challenges every single day, but they don't let that define their day that they had to figure oh they couldn't figure this thing out or their computer had a glitch. They're always having to pivot and move around and solve problems. Right. So they have a different mindset. Um, well, except if you're, uh, my, my middle son is Mitch and um, he's quite the middle child. Let me tell you, he's perfect at being a middle child. And if you don't have the right waffles in the freezer, well, then yeah, <laughs> other than that. Yeah. <laughs> then his day is ruined. Yeah. Otherwise, so, is- I kind of wanted to touch on the title of your book. I see mm-hmm. the end of you because as we're talking, I'm, I'm at first I read the title of the book and I was like, Ooh, like ye. However, now, after talking to you, I can see that I see the end of you can be a very hopeful message as well. Like, yeah. it's not just about, I know how this is going to go and you're going to lose your life. But That's there right. are there are other pieces to that. Like, I see the end of you, depending on your response, how this is going to play for you. That's right. Yeah. So, the you know, I, I, it started with that, looking at that scan where I saw that brain tumor and all the stuff that I knew about glioblastoma. And I've seen the end of you. I know what's going to happen to you. And, and as it turns out, 
I, as I wrote in the book, I do have a 10 year survivor now. Like every day Eli Powell is alive. I know that, that I you know, didn't know as much as I thought I did about that disease. And what, what I figured out, and I think all of us have come to the same conclusion, is that when you're faced with a great challenge in your life, it is equally as great an opportunity for you to find out who God is, find out who you are, you know, find out what your real destiny is, because the, the thing that's landed in your lap is going to redefine how the rest of your life is going to play out. And you can either let it wreck you or you can let it sort of uh, resurrect you, if you will. Oh, I love that. <laughs> as much as I hate to say it, I think we're going to have to to wind up this conversation, although I hope we can have you back because I think I could go on and on and on listening to you for I'd hours. I'd love to be back. Yeah. It's just that would be stuff. wonderful. But before we go, I want you to, if you could, Lee, tell everybody where they can find you, where they can find the book, which I know I will be getting very soon, um, and how they can get hold of you and, and reach you. Great. So um, my website is my name, Um and uh, you can get to my newsletter, which is free every Sunday. It's sort of, uh, I always say you can't change your life until you change your mind. Like you got to change how you think about the troubles that you're having or you can't get through it. Um, and so newsletter is a great way to connect. Uh, the Dr. Lee Warren podcast, you can get to it from my website or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, and then my latest book I've seen the interview is everywhere, anywhere you can get a book, uh, you can get it. Um, and it's really about hope. You know, it's, it's about the idea that hopelessness is the worst thing you can encounter and hope is the best thing you can have. And uh, I hope folks will connect. I'd love to hear from them. Awesome. Well, I know, I know I signed up already for the, for the mm -hmm. newsletter. I can't wait to get my first one. <laughs> I'll be looking for that on Sunday morning. And I'm, I'm your, I'm the podcast addict. I listen to your <laughs> podcast. You know what the thing too is I listen, I said to Mary Fran, I'm listening in the mornings because I am, I get up ridiculously early. So I have some peace, especially now that everyone's in my face in quarantine. Right. And, and I, we are like off the rails here all day, 80 million things going on. And, and yours, your voice is nice and calm and your guests, I'd love to just sit and dive in and listen to them. So, so, um, yeah, when you keep seeing it pinging from Philadelphia, that's me. <laughs> there she is again, listening and re-listening. Good, good stuff. I'm so happy that you made the time in the midst of, gosh, moving across the country and, and so many things going on and the book coming out and all that. I so appreciate that you took the time to, to sit and chat with us. And I know I, I was thinking of so many people as we're talking that are going to benefit from this. And the majority of them are the rare disease community that I spend a lot of mm -hmm. time in um, that have a lot of hardship um, and trying to navigate the not teetering into doubt and staying in, in faith. So this is, this is so great. I'm so glad we had the time to do this. Thanks so much I, for joining us. Thank you I so much. I appreciate you Lee. both. Thank you so much, Mary and Kristen. Uh, God bless you all for the work that you're doing. And uh, Yeah, I'd love to come back sometime. Thank you. We'd cool. love to have you. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in to another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. And we will uh, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. <laughs> thanks for tuning in to the Brilliantly Resilient Podcast. Join our Facebook group and follow us on YouTube to be inspired with tools to reset, rise, and reveal your brilliance.